you can look at how these little non-planar tangles move about and interact. Well, maybe it doesn't just look like particle physics. Maybe this is the <laughs> essence of particle physics, right? I've heard you talk about the possibility that elementary particles might be non-planar tangles in the graph. So I, I like this idea of like persistent perturbations that propagate through the hypergraph. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, how the hypergraph might give rise to elementary particles? Yeah, absolutely. And let me be completely upfront about this. Of the parts of the model that are, that are less developed, this is definitely one of them, right? So, yeah. so the stuff we've done on general relativity, quantum mechanics, that kind of stuff, there are big open questions, but I'd say that's comparatively well developed. Understanding of particle content, matter content, that's still pretty embryonic. Yeah. So we have some ideas about how that would work. And as you say, these ideas about persistent topological obstructions of which these non-planar tangles are a good kind of at least toy model. Yeah. That's the leading idea we have right now. But I would love to be able to point at some piece of hypergraph and say, oh, yeah, that's like definitely an electron or something. <laughs> exactly, but I, think we're, yeah. I think we're a few steps away from being able to do something like that. Indeed. But yeah, okay. So, so the, the basic idea is, so I think planarity is a, is a useful, well, I don't think our actual universe is a two-dimensional planar graph. So Planarity yeah. is almost certainly not the real model for particles, or non-planarity is not a real model for particles, but it's a yeah. good toy example that illustrates some of the core features of what we're talking about. And by planarity, just to be clear, you just mean that the graph can be laid out as a flat plane? Yes, exactly. Okay, so yeah, so, so it's, it's worth, particularly for those of your audience who have not encountered too much graph theory, maybe it's worth defining yeah. some of these terms. So if you've got a network or a graph, planarity, exactly as Mark said, is the property that you can embed it in a two-dimensional plane without the edges crossing, right? So. Yeah. There are many graphs which you can do that with, but the famous one, because it relates to this famous riddle, is the utility graph, this bipartite complete graph on three by three vertices. It's this famous problem where you've got three utilities like electricity, water, gas, or something, and you've got three houses, and you want to connect every utility to every house in such a way that the pipes don't cross for some reason. Yeah. And you can't do it. And the reason is because that graph, the bipartite complete graph on three by three vertices, is non-planar. There's no way yeah. to embed it in the plane without the edges crossing over. And it turns out there's a collection of theorems, specifically Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem in graph theory, that say that if you have a non-planar graph, that in a very precise sense, that non-planarity can be reduced to a, a certain number of instances of one of two kind of canonically non-planar graphs, what's called K5, the complete graph on five vertices where every vertex is connected to every other vertex, and K33, the utility graph that we just described. So Kuratowski's theorem states that every non-planar graph must have a subgraph that is a subdivision of either K5 or K33. So yeah. basically, I mean, let's not get bogged down in the details of precisely what that means, but basically all it's saying is that somehow non-planarity you can always ascribe to the presence of one or more instances of either K5 or K33 in your graph. So what that means is, imagine you defined a rewriting rule that preserved planarity, so that the left-hand side and the right-hand side were both planar. So in other words, that the graph after applying the rule is planar if and only if the graph was planar before you applied the rule. Yeah. So you might define this as a planarity-preserving rule. Yeah. So if that's true, now let's imagine you've got a little non-planar tangle. You've got a little K5 or a little K33 like knocking about in that graph. Because the rule is planarity-preserving, the rule is not going to create or destroy those tangles. They're just going to kind of propagate around as these persistent obstructions, these persistent localized disturbances. The only way that they might conceivably get eliminated is if they have some kind of collision event, they mutually annihilate or something. Yeah. You can do this. You can, you can set up these planarity-preserving rewrite rules and look at how these little non-planar tangles kind of move about and interact, and you can construct things that look a lot like Feynman diagrams, where you have two non-planar pieces that come in, they have some period of interaction, then two or more non-planar pieces come out. And so they have essentially a kind of whole particle physics of how they move around and how they interact and which interactions between different non-planar pieces can give rise to what other non-planar pieces and so on. And you can build a kind of taxonomy of these Feynman diagrams. And as I say, it looks intuitively a lot like particle physics. Yeah. And so one is therefore very tempted to conclude, well, maybe it doesn't just look like particle physics. Maybe this is the <laughs> essence of particle physics, right? Yeah. So as I say, clearly for our universe, something like non-planarity is not going to be the answer. Yeah. But there is a generalization of these ideas like Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem called the Seymour-Robertson theorem. Probably the best way I can explain it is that those subgraphs, K5 and K33, for the case of planarity, in the context of Wagner's theorem, they're called forbidden minors. So a graph minor, taking a graph minor is where you take some graph and then you delete vertices or edges in a particular way. That corresponds to the operation of taking minors. So K5 and K33 are called forbidden minors 
Because if your graph is planar, they are miners that cannot be yes. derived from, from, from the graph you started from. In other yeah. words, if either of those appears as a minor of your graph, you know that the graph you started from couldn't have been planar. Yeah. So this is called a forbidden minor characterization. And the Seymour-Robertson theorem tells you that there is a, basically an infinite class of different kinds of graphs that permit these forbidden minor characterizations. So planar graphs are just one special case of the Seymour-Robertson theorem, but there are many, many others. And some of these have much less restrictive constraints than just you know, graph planarity. Seymour Robertson is interesting for a lot of reasons, but one is that it's essentially like a sort of combinatorial analogue of a, really a, a topological theorem, that it's treating the forbidden minors as like topological obstructions in a graph. So what you get from the Seymour Robertson theorem is effectively, for a given class of graphs, it gives you essentially like a collection, it basically gives you particle content, right? Yes. It says, <laughs> if you have a rule that preserves this property of your graph, then these are the localized topological obstructions that will be preserved yeah. by that rule, and therefore these are your candidate elementary particles. Yeah. So from this really unexpected source of this very abstract theorem of combinatorics, we basically yeah. get a statement of like, what particle content could we expect for a rule that satisfies a given set of constraints? And that's what yeah. you get from this forbidden minor characterization. And so that's our current best guess for how elementary yeah. particles will work. That there's some property of the hypergraph that gets preserved by the rules and yeah. violations of that property or forbidden minors under that property correspond to the particle content because they are then the things that will behave like these localized topological obstructions. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.